almost there. Let's get started with the attendance. All right. Okay, now go to Zoom call. Done. All right. Yeah, let me see, be able to see this. All right, get the attendance going. Hopefully everybody can see me. All right, my volume is the full 100% volume. And let's do, uh, and please, those of you, most of you are online, that we just have about three students who are here. So please do respond and let me know who is online, okay? Uh, do we have Jules? Jules? I'm here. Okay. All right. Present, uh, Abigail. Abigail. All right. Rebel. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Zanaya. Zanaya. Here. Okay. Stephanie. Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie, not here. Okay. Uh, Vinnie. Vinnie, absent Sydney is here with us here. Valeria, Valeria, absent Sam, Sam, Samuel, I think you're online. Idali is here with us. Josh, Josh, are you here? Uh, absent Amber, yeah, Amber is here. First, Amber is here with us. Uh, Santiago, Santiago, here. Okay, uh, Vanessa, Vanessa, here. All right, Grace, Grace, absent Diego, here. oh, Diego, <laughs> Jack. All right, I'm just going to repeat the names of those of you who I did not hear from. Uh, I'll just repeat it once again. I'm going to pull the screen as well. One second, I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Have to innovate. How do I make it easy for class to see? Me? Okay. See me, right? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So here we go. We are done with the attendance. I'm just going to repeat the names of those of you who I did not hear from. Uh, so if you can hear, and uh, if you did not hear your name, please let me know. Abigail, Gerardo. Stephanie, Vinnie, Val Valeria, Samuel, Josh, um, Grace, and Jack. All right, I'm submitting the attendance, submit. All right, here we go. Today is the last lecture because today uh, we covered what we, you know, uh, your persuasive speech uh, templates in, in class for the last lecture. This today is the second, perhaps the second day of our discussion. I'm just going to our slide here, and I'm showing you that we did start our discussion of uh, of first phase uh, of first phase of speech. Remember November of uh, here we go. So November fourteenth, uh, uh, I wasn't if I had to cancel class on November fourteenth, but we did start talking about first phase of speech on from November 9th onwards. And the first, the first thing that we learned, just to do a little bit of a recap, the first thing that we uh, talked about was um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we went into depth, and then we went into 
uh, we had our uh, we had little focus groups where you actually talked about how um, some of the needs, perhaps like the, the the five needs, which is the physiological need, the safety need, the uh, love and belongingness, self esteem, and self actualization needs. You look in looked into that, really got into it, and then you did a uh, you did an exercise by yourself, and then you did it with the group, basically talking about some of the persuasive speech topics that would um, that were aligned to some of the needs. And some of you also saw that some of the needs that you were talking about, or some of some of the uh, precisely you, some of the topics, persuasive speech topics that we were talking about was aligned with not only one need, but it was actually getting overlapping with several needs. And those were the topics that were, you know, very interesting. Not only did it generate interest, but it's also, you also had a lot of power as a, as a speaker to, to influence the audience because it, it kind of uh, uh, overlapped with several needs. So we did that on the, uh, I'll just give you, to give you a timeline. We did that on the ninth. November 14th class was canceled. Um, I'm sorry, huh? here, November 9th, November 14th class was canceled. November 16th is when we talked about uh, the whole um, Maslow's, I'm sorry, Monroe's, motive, uh, Dr. Alan Monroe's motivated sequence, which was a sequence of five steps, the attention step, the need step, uh, satisfaction, visualization, and action step. And out of that, we discussed that at, in depth in class, and I asked you all to submit your persuasive uh, scripts uh, by midnight on Sunday. And I saw it today and I graded it and I've turned it into you. So uh, those were, I've already got your persuasive speech scripts. So now just to kind of give you an idea of what's to come. Uh, today, what I'll do is I will take some time uh, during our class session to kind of talk to you if there were any parts that you would like to talk to me about, where you were getting stuck and you need some ideas. I am open to that uh, and I'll, I'll reserve a little bit of class time for us to do that, maybe towards the end of our class, all right? And uh, another thing that I would like you, all of you, because today is a lot of, today is kind of going to be in terms of uh, learning, your, it's going to be the highest learning curve because what you're going to do, which I kind of gave you a little bit of just before ending the class and I was looking at our video recording, I just introduced to you, just like, you know, I gave you a preview of what's to come today, which is Toolman's model of argumentation. Uh, and uh, first, so what you did so far is you gave me your whole speech script. And that speech script is actually three minutes of your uh, talking time. All right. So that's what you're going to be prepared with. That's it. You know, that three minutes of uh, persuasive speech time that you get, that's the one that you will have total control over and you'll be prepared with that one. The next part of the speech is, remember, it's going to be a five to maybe seven minute speech, okay? I, I will probably, uh, you know, you, you can't go lesser than five minutes for sure, but you do, I don't want you to go more than five, seven minutes, okay? And then this time, I'm a little more flexible regarding the time because questions will be asked by the audience. I do not know how long will the audience take, take to kind of ask you, ask you a question, kind of also, you know, maybe if you are not understanding the question, maybe provide a clarifying point, you know, with the back and forth, I don't have control on that. So, however, I probably, through with my experience, I don't think it should be more than seven minutes. So your first argument is the one that you guys sent me on in your homework on Blackboard. That's your first argument that should not be more than three minutes. The next part of your speech, and I'm going to show you how it is done. Actually, we have a whole video of showing you how I've done it for some of my classes and that will kind of give you more idea. So uh, the next part is when the audience will ask you questions, all right? The, so the, the audience is going to ask you questions as in the form of a counter argumentation. So think about your what you submitted as your persuasive speech slash your first argument, which is about three minutes, okay? So audience hears your, uh, your, your argument makes an analysis and pushes you, okay, with a counter argument, something that kind of opposes your, your argument, perhaps shows the weakness in your argument, and I'll tell you how it is done, okay? So um, you hear the argument and from the audience, and how many of you are going to write the counter argument? You might be asking yes, but all of you. So let's say Sydney is here, and Sydney goes with the first argument, her speech, three-minute speech, she comes and gives you her first argument. All of you hear her first argument, and you have to start typing. Right after you hear, you type her 
uh, uh, a counter argument in response to her first argument. And then I, for lack of time, I cannot pick everybody. So I'll pick like two students, like I'm gonna pick Amber and Diego to respond to uh, Sydney's counter, uh, uh, to Sydney's argument with the counter argument. There's a strategy of doing that, which we are, are going to cover today. How do you write? How do you uh, create a counter argument? So today we have a lot to cover. After uh, Sydney hears a counter argument from Amber and Diego, uh, then she responds back to them. So that's a blind spot, as you can know. She can only be prepared with the first argument. She really doesn't know what's going on in Amber's mind or Diego's mind and what, how, what their counter argument is. So, but she has to know her speech so well that it will almost be, uh, I would probably say an impromptu response and improvised response, okay? So, uh, so that's what she, so when she hears a counter argument, she has to refute or we call this refutation or she has, in other words, she has to defend her position. So she comes up with a defense for herself um, to Amber's counter argument and to um, Diego's counter argument. And then the whole debate speech ends there. So that's what's going to happen. So today my focus to you is focus uh, is to talk about Toolman's model of argumentation. It's important for you to understand that model and to uh, and actually kind of make it, uh, I give you a choice. And I haven't done that with you guys, but if you want to take up a further challenge of not using Persuade, or, or of not using Monroe's motivated sequence and using Toolman's model of argumentation to create your argumentation, more power to you. If you want to do that, you can do that. It's, it's again, it's I'm not mandating it. It's a choice. If you want to do it, you can do it. Uh, the reason uh, for, for you to understand Toolman's model of argumentation, if you don't understand that well, you will never, uh, it'll, <laughs> you will, uh, it, it'll be hard for you to come up with a solid counter argumentation, okay, counter argue. Uh, so because it actually te teaches you how to hear somebody's argument, how to understand the, the core of the argument, how do you respond to the core of that argument through, through uh, understanding the reasoning that the person has used and responding to that, sometimes we call it attacking, or, but I don't want to use that word here, responding to the reasoning, responding to the uh, uh, kind of critiquing the proofs that the person has used. So there are several ways. And if it'll be hard for you to, if I, I'll probably say that I want you to have the best experience. So I'm going to teach you this one, uh, Toolman's model of argumentation, because that will really give you a taste of how debate is done. Well, I could probably have a whole semester of like, you know, just, just debates, okay? Or uh, just just about whole class lecture about argumentation, uh, you know, uh, advocacy, how do you create different, but the, I, I, we didn't, you know, we had to cover so many other things in class. So, but however, the last section, I really wanted you guys to all have a good, a good taste of how a debate will feel. Is it the, is it the whole experience? No, but uh, will you have a good, uh, hold on it and will you be able to understand and enjoy debates and also be enthusiastic to take part in a debate? Maybe yes. All right. So here we go. I am going to uh, uh, show you what I have here for you. All right. And I'm going to go to Blackboard. So here I am in Blackboard and I will go to your, I've already put the slides. I mean, instructor PowerPoint. And all you have today for today's class, you have to go to the last PowerPoint, which is argumentation and debate, and you open that. Okay, so those of you who are uh, you know, following us online, this is also, as I said, if you want to just kind of not, because you're watching, as I, as I told you, the camera is, I, this, it's a home camera that I have. Uh, you may want to go into your Blackboard and go to our argumentation debate and then follow from there, it's up to you. Okay, so here, uh, this is what we have, argumentation and debate speech. 
Uh, I have here kind of told you five minute to three minute first argument, which is a standard three minute first opening argument, which you all of you have already turned it to me, uh, which was your Monroe's motivated sequence, attention, needs, um, satisfaction, visualization, uh, and action, right? You already have given it to me. So you don't have to be bothered about that anymore. Uh, that has already been done, but this is all introducing another template for you. So if you are interested, you can uh, use the, use this template as well. Not a compulsion. Again, I'm just saying that this is a choice. If you want to use this and you feel that this is going to be much more uh, solid in terms of creating arguments, you can do that as well. The one that I have given you, uh, Monroe's motivated sequence with the five steps is a much simpler, easier model and has much more, uh, I would say that as a starting point, students find that easy. Uh, easier uh, than than this one. So that's why I kind of said that you guys have to submit that. But if you want to want to challenge yourself further, you can also use this one. So uh, so right now, uh, the first argument has already been turned in. Uh, it's done by on Sunday, you guys turn that into me, I will be again, as I mentioned, I will be looking into it even further. If you have questions or concerns with any of the steps, I would be happy to look into it. Okay. Now, uh, this is, we are now getting prepared for one minute counter argumentation and one minute refutation. This is what we are going to be covering today in class. So here, so this is uh, the, the, the person who is the, who's the you know, guest of honor today. Uh, his name is, uh, he's, he's a British philosopher, a Londoner. Uh, his name is um, Stephen Toulmin. And, uh, you know, uh, and he, this is based out of his, uh, he created, this model of argumentation. And of course he has bragging rights because he created this one. So it's, it's, uh, it's named after him. It's called Toolman's model of argumentation, all right? And uh, Toolman's model of argumentation, uh, this is what it does. Uh, here, uh, I'm going to talk about this, but I you know, give you a little bit of a backstory because that always helps me to, and I always have a picture because I, sometimes I keep thinking that Oh, who is this person? Why did he do this? What was he, you know, thinking about at that time? This helps me. So I, so I'm going to share this backstory. There are certain things which I'm totally confirmed. Those are not rumors, but there are certain things that I, that was kind of like a hearsay. But I'll share that with you as well. So here, uh, uh, Stephen Toulmin actually was, a, as I mentioned, he was a Londoner, and uh, he was, uh, he came up with this. Uh, he was very active. His work life, in terms of his work life, he was very active during the Second World War. Okay, so you can you can have you have an idea of you know nineteen somewhere in the nineteen mid nineteen thirties mid nineteen thirties, and he was very active. And believe it or not, he was actually a strategist. He uh, created military strategies and tactics. So I was very interested. I think military strategies and creating a model of argumentation. These are like two different. I said I guess there's some kind of convergence happening. Two different skills. But okay, so he did this and uh, he uh, actually created this Toolman's model of argumentation. And one of the reasons uh, why this is so helpful is at that time, you, know, you have to remember, not, we're talking about Second World War during the 1930s, early London at that point uh, was going to be, you know, the whole world was going through a chaos. But at that point, he felt that when people were arguing, uh, most of the people were arguing if they did argue, uh, they were using Aristotle's formal syllogism, okay, which is like inductive reasoning. We don't have to get too much into that. Don't don't worry if you're not able to. It's like formal logic, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, which is very, which is excellent, but it is very discipline specific, okay. Regular people like us, we perhaps don't have the interest to understand so much of logic and form so much of reasoning and. Very, very honestly, uh, when we have to make an argument, uh, you know, when we have to create arguments, how many of us would like to go back to Aristotle's all of the intricate philosophy and logic? Uh, we don't, we, perhaps some of us don't have the interest, some of us don't, don't have the time, um, some, of, for some, of, sorry, some of us, it's not even relatable. So at that point, he said, you know what, let me, let me do something that, that kind of, uh, it, you know, people, it, people will find it a lot relatable. Uh, they really don't have to understand all the various, uh, you know, various formulas and concepts of formal uh, logic. And they don't have to understand this. This I'm going to make it 
pretty simple and pretty user friendly. And I'm going to create this for our everyday conversation, for a regular person, okay, for everyday human beings in different walks of life. You don't have to be an engineer or you don't have to be a philosophy major to understand this, okay? It can be used by everyone. So he said, let me make something for you, which is very, you know, which is very easy, um, perhaps not very easy, but which is uh, not very um, uh, discipline specific, okay? Which doesn't, anybody can understand this one. So he, that's why he said that, um, let me create this. And you may be wondering at this point is how did he, what, where did he draw the inspiration from, right? How did, why, why did he, you know, who was he looking at? So this is a backstory that I've heard and I don't know how much of it is true, but this is what I've heard that Stephen Toolman used to, and you know, everybody has a backstory as I kind of shared it with you with Maslow, Abraham Maslow's, uh, uh, when, he, when he thought about Maslow's hierarchy, how he, there was a backstory into it. Uh, because uh, when we talked about Monroe, Dr. Alan Monroe from Purdue University, how there was a backstory with that he was very influenced by the way how car salespeople talk and how they sell cars. And, and he actually heard several conversations and he created a theory out of it, right? He also has a backstory. I don't know how much of it is true or not, but I've heard that he was very influenced by the way lawyers would talk, okay? So in the legal courtroom proceedings, he was very influenced by how how do lawyers make the, their arguments so strong, so pertinent, and why should why do you always feel like listening to them? So he actually went and heard several courtrooms proceedings, right? And as I've mentioned to you, success leaves clues, and and it left clues. And he was a you know he he was of course a scholar, you know, brilliant person, a theorist, uh, and he created a model based on several courtroom proceedings that he heard, okay? And he called it the Toolman's model of argumentation. So now what he did is what he, sim he simplified, he worked on it. He says, you know what? The regular people, that is you, me, whoever, uh, does not, they don't need to hear or understand legal jargons and terminology. That, let's, I'm gonna get that, get it out of there. What they need to understand is how is understanding happening, okay? So I'm going to get all the legal term, you know, legal technical jargons all out of the picture. And I'm going to just simplify it and create a model that will help them to understand how do we create strong arguments? How do we create, make a claim? How do we support that claim? How do we know, uh, you know, what are the weaknesses in the claim? How do we position that? And how do we be, how, how should we be open to co counter arguments and how do we defend ourselves? That's what he was interested in. So that's how he created this. Now, why are we doing this? You know, as I mentioned to you a little bit of uh, my history, is that I have been involved as a judge in, in, in debates. And some of the judges, uh, some of these events have happened at our Glen Ellen Center here as we talk. Uh, we've had huge debating debates, uh, uh, college debates, and where we had uh, different colleges, intercolleges participating from in the state of Illinois. So I've done that here, and then uh, 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 where, where, when at not, I've also done it at North Central College, where you know debates happened, and I was uh, judging. So one of the things uh, I have, and I've talked talk to some of my peers, uh, and I think most of us will agree that one of the models that is primarily used to teach how debates and argumentation, counter argumentation, is then is this man's Toolman's model of argumentation. It's going to be very hard to not teach a student of debate uh, his model of argumentation. Uh, so that's why I'm going to talk about it. And I want all of you to get the fee of a debate. Okay, so here we go. Um, and then I have a little backstory about how a debate happens. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you all that. Okay, a little, 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 when I take a little break. Okay, so here we go and I, this is my plan here. So this is the model, okay? I think, all right, let me see. Yeah. All right, so this is the model, the data claim boring backing modifier rebuttal, okay? And uh, I will be going, this is, as I mentioned to you, in terms of learning curve and challenge, this is today is perhaps the most challenging one. So I 
really wanted all of you to be here. Uh, anyways, so anyways, if you guys are here online and you, all of you are here. Uh, so uh, pay attention. I will be covering this. Uh, this is going to be uh, included in your um, in your persuasive speech, in, in your last speech. So if you don't understand this, you will uh, lose points there. So pay attention. What I will be doing is uh, I will be talking to you first uh, just about and going, going through the concepts. That's going to be very theoretical at that point. Then I will be giving you an example. And then I will be giving you a speech example. I'll be showing you a little clip, three and a half minute clip, uh, uh, a speech by President Obama. And there will be a there will be a class assignment on that one. In class, as I said, those of you are online will have to do it. Everybody will have to do it, do a class in class uh, assignment. So pay full attention to it. I will be playing that clip thrice. And then I will actually ask you based on what you heard, I'll ask you what's the data, what's the claim, what's the warrant, what's the backing modifier and the button. It's an in-class assignment. And I want all of you to pay attention. I will be uh, put giving you all uh, points, grades for that one. So uh, pay attention here, okay? All right, the first thing is, um, this is what uh, he, Toulman says that in an argument, uh, first of all, uh, let me just pause before I start talking about argument. Can anybody tell me what do you mean by argument? When I say argument, what, what comes to your mind? What's an argument? What's an argument for you? Is it a fight? It is. It, it is. A, it could be a, yeah. Sorry, that is. Fight of words. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's an exchange. All right. It's an exchange of counteracting views. It's a fight of words. Exchange of counter, uh, you know, uh, exchange of counteracting views. Uh, the who's, uh, Diego and Amber, both of you are here. Anything that comes to your mind, you want to add to it or? Okay, kind of in the same, same zone. Okay, all right. So here, uh, so yeah, so typically when we say, you know, I, I had an argument with my boss, exchange of words or, or you know, counteract, counteracting views. Uh, yeah, we do, we use it uh, when, we, uh, when we talk about, you know, an exchange of ideas, which were of course counteracting and heated words. Uh, but however, the way we have used it here, when you say that I'm your first argument, it is when you are making a claim, okay? When you're making a claim, so let's say you're saying that, uh, you know, smoking on campus should be completely taken out and there should be no smoking on the COD campus. You're making, that's an argument uh, and you, you haven't fully finished it, but you're making a claim uh, that it should be completely, um, there should be there should be you know no, no smoking zones as well. There should be complete the whole campus should be completely smoke smoke free. Okay, so if you are making a claim like this that you're actually demanding also that uh, the whoever makes the decisions in in the College of DuPage to be the president to be the board actually enforce that. Uh, so you are making an argument and it is based on how well why did you make this claim. Because it must be because of certain reasons. You may think that it is actually you are a non smoker. Perhaps I'm just throwing it out. Maybe you are a non smoker and it affects you uh, when you cross uh, smoking zones. It may you may feel uh, uh, feel that your fellow students are also having the same problem. You are being their voice as well. Uh, you may feel that uh, in terms of remember needs in terms of environment. If you think about uh, self-actualization, morale, uh, you know, doing something for the environment is, is, a, is, a, well, is a moral thing to do, right? That it is important that we stop polluting environment with, with uh, cigarette smoke. Uh, if you're thinking about your health, safety, safety esteem, uh, safety, self-esteem, there's so many other needs that you can think about. So that is why you're making a claim like this, that there should be no smoking zones in COD. Okay, so that's an argument when you're making a claim based on a based on certain reasons, and uh, which you can back up. You can back it up with your own evidence and proof. And of course, you can also say that there are some exceptions if you want to. There are some exceptions to your claim. Okay, so that's an argument. Argument basically makes you are making a claim, claim which can be uh, count, uh, which can be co uh, contrary or opposite someone's view, somebody else who's a perhaps a smoker or who is maybe a non-smoker, 
can come and say that no, you can't really do that. You're you're being, you know, you are uh, being irrational. You can't do that. You you know, they, I know that you're saying all of this and it's a health issue and everything. But you know, there are people who are who are in this habit. And right now, if you make such a rule, there people will not come to the campus. We lose students, and there should be a way to do this. And I think there should be some kind of a moderation. They might come and attack you by saying that. So that's a clash of views, right? So that's an argument. Now, having said that, let's let's analyze this. Data claim, warrant, backing, modifier, rebuttal. All right, here we go. So let's say you are interested in Netflix and I mean, you're interested in a crime series uh, that you're watching on maybe Amazon Prime or on Netflix, okay? And there are 12 episodes. And by the 12th episode, we actually get to know you probably have maybe three or four suspicious picks, okay? You may think that this one is a serial killer. Oh, no, 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 no. Maybe the second one. Maybe the, th the third person doesn't have a motive. Oh, maybe that's, maybe they're trying to fool me there. I think this person seems, doesn't, seems to have no motive, but I think this one's the killer. So you kind of make deductions, right? We all do that all the time. So when I tell you data, data is all the 12 episodes that you're watching, okay? We, that's what Toolman calls it, the evidence or the proof. The whole episode one, two, tw one through 12 is all the data that you have, which we call is interchangeably, we call it data, we call it what, you know, what your ground is, we call it evidence or proof. That's what you have, okay? That, that's the raw matter that you have based on what you make a deduction, okay? So those 12 episodes is the, is the data that you have. Second one, the most important one, without which there is no argument, is claim, okay? So based on those 12 episodes of Netflix uh, crime series that you're watching, you may make a conclusion or make a claim that based on these evidence, I think so-and-so, uh, I think Dr. Sen is the killer, okay? All right, so if you, if you think about it that way, right? So you make, or maybe she's the killer or so much so somebody, somebody else is the killer or second preference. Of, you may come have three or four things, but there'll be a prime suspect that you have, okay? That's the claim. Basically, the claim is the conclusion that you arrive at from the from your data. So, all with all the evidence, everything that you watch in those twelve episodes, you will come to a claim or a conclusion about who the person, who the killer is, right? So that's the claim. Uh, interestingly, uh, <laughs> when we watch documentaries or when we, uh, you know, typically in in life, when we hear we. We kind of hear a conversation and then we understand that this is the claim that kind of the claim is always the end last the last thing that is happening right when you hear the whole data and then something magically happens in your mind and then you make a conclusion however in your debates or, or you know in your uh, speech your persuasive the whole speech the first thing that you have to do you have to do it work it backwards okay first you introduce your claim and then you work backwards to show you how you can prove your claim, almost like a math problem that you've done, okay? If you've done theorems and writers, you see that you make a claim and then you keep trying, keep trying to prove how, how your claim is correct, okay? So here we go. So in a speech, in a debate, you first begin with your claim and then you show how your claim is true. Warrant. Now, when you think about this, when you think about my Netflix example here, so when I tell you know when you're watching those twelve episodes of Netflix and you're making a claim like this uh, that so and so is the killer, there must be something that is helping you to come to this decision, and that magical process uh, that happens is what Toolman calls it the reasoning. All right, he says let's not make it a very big deal. Let's let's not make it rocket science. Every person, human being, has this common sense or common knowledge. That is, we call it reasoning, okay? After watching so many things, it will help, you know, so many evidence points of proof, there is some kind of reasoning that is happening in that mind of the person that will help the person, audience, or, you know, whoever the, is creating the, uh, the, 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 uh, the speech, uh, there's something that, will, that is happening that will help the person to make a jump. We call it an inferential jump jump from the data to the claim. So those 12 episodes that I've watched kind of gave me clues, clues, evidence, clues, clues, and that will, however, everything that I watch will help me make a jump from the data to the claim. And this jump 
data and the claim. This jump is what we call is reasoning, the process of reasoning. Why? You know, this is common knowledge. You know, you watch something and then you say, okay, I think on the basis of this, uh, this so and so is the killer. That's just what that's what Warren does. So and that's one of the most important things. That, you know, this is you 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 really cannot have an argument without uh, data claim and warrant. These three are essential. And sometimes this warrant is pretty 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 uh, explicit. You will you actually see things like this is why I think that you know this is why so and such and such is true. Sometimes very implied, and most of the times it's very implicit. You really don't see it. Uh, but you understand the process that this is the reason. Sometimes the reasoning is not, you can't really see it in words, but you understand that sometimes it goes on unconsciously. And this, as I mentioned to you, when you're jumping the data to the claim, it's an inferential. We call it inference. Remember inference conclusion? Inferentially, that will help, that helps you. That's the magical uh, concept of Warren that Toolman establishes. Okay. So I talked to you about data, claim, and words. Now we'll go to backing. So backing is, is a little nuanced here because you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to confuse backing and warrant. And it, most of the time, at least I was very confused when I heard this one. I said, oh, what is, what is, then what is warrant? Then then what is backing? I was always very confused about this. So I'm going to make it clear for you. So warrant is the reasoning and backing is in a supportive role. All right, think about is not, you know, doesn't have, a, you know, is not the main, these are the three main protagonists, okay? Data claim warrant. You can't really have an argument without the three. Backing is in a supporting role, okay? The only job of backing is to help warrant, okay? So it keeps supporting warrant and it, it exists because you may, you may want to, you, you want to make sure that, uh, that your reasoning is correct. So warrant, backing will always provide um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, it's not additional evidence, but it will also always provide uh, reference for warrant to kind of make sure that that whether the warrant is, is correct or not, it will just keep supporting. So if the warrant is not very strong, backing will make sure, backing will, will let us know, the person who's creating the argument, that your warrant is not very strong. So backing is always or like a checkpoint in a supportive role to make sure that the warrant is correct, your reasoning is correct. Uh, next is modifier. Okay, modifier in an argument is almost like a think about it as a thermostat in a room. Okay, so if you want to, if you're if you're very cold, you want to you increase the heat because you're cold, right? Uh, if you are, yeah, yeah. So I just want to, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's like I want to really as well. So it's yeah. kind of like. The claim is like, uh, don't eat this mushroom because it's poison. Okay. The warrant would be, or like, right. Uh, it's the claim is don't eat the mushroom. Then warrant would be because it's poison. Yeah. The backing would be poison is bad for you. Kill you. Absolutely, absolutely got that. Totally on target. Poison will be my uh, yeah back. And I think I can go a little further as well. Uh, poison is uh, bad. It can be ingested quickly. Uh, it can lead to, uh, you know, respiration problems. And all of that is backing. It's not, uh, it is not reasoning. It is not, at, warrant is, poison is bad for you. You should not have ingested poison. Poison leads to death, right? And backing will probably talk about how poison, why and how and so this. like putting more supporting details. Small putting more supporting details. Absolutely, bingo. So that's what it is, okay? Uh, modifier here is like, think about it as a thermostat, all right? So if your room is very, very cold, you may want to come and turn on the heat because it's very cold, right? Or if the room is very hot, you may want to come and cool it down. So think about this as a thermostat of your argument. It shows the degree of certainty. So you and this modifier is very visual. It is. It is, there's no implicit, anything implicit about it. it. It is words chosen to show how strong you feel about your, uh, about the certainty of your claim, okay? So most of the times it will be, let's say, um, after, after careful consideration, that's a modifier because you're trying to show that you have kind of analyzed the, the, the pros and cons of an argument, okay? After careful, so you show that you know after that that you are not really saying that you're hundred percent sure, 
But you think that you have really, uh, you know, kind of weighed the pros and cons after careful words, like after careful con uh, consideration with 100% certainty, with some reservation. These are words that show how certain are you about your claim, okay? And it's a strategic choice. Sometimes it depends upon you and how you want to position your claim. Sometimes you want to say that you are 100% sure. Sometimes you, you may want to say that I have weighed the pros and cons. Uh, so I have, I, I know what it is, but I'm not like 100% sure, okay? So it's, it, it shows the degree of certitude, how sure about your claim. Again, I'm talk, I tell you all this, these are the first three elements, you have to have it in your argument. These three, if you have it, you are your gold, okay? So I, I, I think it, does. but sometimes people just have these three things and, and I feel that they just make themselves more vulnerable because they're not, this is all done to kind of strengthen your argument, okay? So modifier, it, sometimes people use it, sometimes people don't use it, that's fine, okay? And finally, the interesting part is rebuttal. And I, I think there'll be a lot of questions about this is when we do counter, what is a counter argument? What is a rebuttal? What is refutation? This is what and I, I completely understand if you don't get it or if you have questions because it will take some time. Uh, rebuttal is, an, is, is, is what you are creating for yourself. So you are not really waiting to hear from Amber or Diego uh, uh, your, uh, about your counter argument. You are creating that yourself. We call that an exceptional reservation. So if let's say if I make a claim uh, and I always use my little mouse claim here, which I can't say, let's say I'm using a mouse. Let's think about this as a, I can't draw it here because you guys are here like minister. Let's, oh gosh. <laughs> All right. On. Okay. Okay. So let's say I am using this mouse. Okay. This mouse. I had to, I had to do all of that to show you a mouse. Okay. So I'm using this mouse here and I'm telling you guys, all of you, that this mouse is the best in that uh, Amazon marketplace has to offer. And I'm making a claim like this. So why am I saying this is best? Because I am making a claim like this because my warrant is perhaps that this kind of uh, um, is a very, uh, is the best mouse because it, it is a very utility driven one. I mean, it's very useful. And that is why uh, it, is a, it is a very great mouse. And if I have to use backing for it, then I will probably say that this mouse uh, is, is pretty cheap. It's only available for $9, $9.99. Uh, it, it runs with electricity, so you don't have to bother about batteries. Um, you, I can say that uh, there are several mouses in, in the market, and I have tried several of them, but I think the HP mouse has been with me for the last 10 years. I've been using this. It hasn't gone bad on me. Uh, it's still available in the market. It is very, uh, it is made with, I'm making it up. I, <laughs> it is made with environmental friendly materials. So it's, if you, re, you can recycle this, it's environmentally safe. Um, and, and it's very easily available in, um, in the Amazon marketplace. You, if you have prime membership, you can arrive at your door in four hours. Okay, and on the basis of this, I say that this bounce is the best. And however, I might, this is, goes back to what we are calling, why I'm talking to you about this is because in an argument, you also need to have reservation, rebuttal, okay? Though I make that this mouse is the best, okay? Though I make this claim that this mouse is the best that you, you have. However, this mouse, I'll make it in the claim there. This mouse may not work very well if I dip it in water for an hour. Or if I run this over very hard surface on stones, this might go bad. So I, this is my reservation. I say that though this mouse is the, is, is, is the best, but there are two reservations. Now, having said this, what are the chances, I strategically use it, what are the chances that somebody is going to really think about how bad this mouse is based on the stupid two, sorry, I apologize, based on the two uh, uh, name uh, reservations that I talked about? 
who is going to dip their mouth in water for, for two hours? Who's going to do that for an hour? I don't think so. Or who is going to run it over a hot surface? So the exception that I gave you doesn't make my argument sound weak, but it actually makes you guys, makes my audience, my fellow debater in an ideal world, because they are in the, in the real world, everybody's, as you've seen, is there, everybody's there to just attack each other and eat up each other on the so in the real world in ideal world you just get, get you just know that the person actually knows the pros and cons of the claim very well and the cons that the person that the debater has talked about is inconsequential it's not that important i'm i'm still going to mount that i don't think i'm going to dip it in water for two hours and i have a perfectly fine table why would i run it over a hard surface so you know what i'll go and buy this mouse so that's what we call is a rebuttal. A rebuttal in an argument doesn't make your claim weak, but it shows the audience that you know your product, your argument, your product, your philosophy, uh, your, your idea very well. So, and you can, you can actually say that this is what's very great about my product or idea, and this is where it might not work, okay? So that's what we call it, we, that's how we uh, create an argument, and we call it the data claim, the whole toolman's model of argumentation, Data claim warrant backing modifier rebuttal. I'll take a pause because I did talk about all of this. Uh, and again, those of you are online, you can actually see this um, whole slide on your on uh, instructor PowerPoints. Go to instructors resources and you can see it. Is there any questions at this point that I can have from 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 all of you here uh, on site? Any questions at any step? No. Okay. Uh, from my online, uh, from my students who are online, any questions? <laughs> okay, so I will consider this a go. Now what I'm going to do is, this is the challenging part. You will have a class exercise, okay, class assignment, and you will have to do this, okay? So I just kind of explained Toolman's model of argumentation. Now I will be playing a clip by President Obama, and I'm going to also, uh, uh, I'll be playing a clip, and that's the problem now. How do I show it to you guys online? I will. I will show it to you all online as well. Uh, I'll just go back and I'll turn the camera this way. So pay attention. And I, it's only a three and a half minute clip. I'm going to play it three times, OK? The first time you hear this, the argument, it has all the points that we discussed. It has data, it has claim, it has warrant backing, modifier, and uh, rebuttal. You have to just hear and get a feel. First time, don't, don't, you know, maybe if you want to take notes, you can. First time, I would just want you to get a feel of what, what is he talking about? What's the topic about? What enemy is he talking about? I just want you to get a feel. The second time I'm going to play the three and a half minute clip, I want, want you to start making notes at the time. This is the data, this is the claim, this is the warrant, this is the backing, this is the modifier and rebuttal, okay? And the third time I play it, I'm gonna play it three times. And the third time I play it, I would like you to now kind of check, is this the data? Is Do you think this is the claim? This is the warrant? I want you all to do revision and editing. After that, I want you to turn it in to me. I, I haven't created that spot for you, but once after I show you all the videos, I will give you some time and by that time I'll open it up for you on Blackboard and then you guys can turn it in, okay? So here we go, give me a second. And uh, so all of you, I will play it for my online class. I'll, I'll kind of reverse the camera and show it to you. So let me just go ahead and do that. Okay, so if you, uh, all of you again, if you are looking for, you can take a screenshot of this one. For those of you who don't go to, you know, if you don't want to go to your instructor PowerPoints, you can take a screenshot. Or if you want to go to your instructor portals, you can go there as well. So here I have it. I actually didn't view it, but I've done it so many times that I exactly know what's where I need to pause and YouTube. Oh, sorry. Uh, two minutes model of our No, not this one. Ah, this is the one. 
and it's a 13 minute, 13 minutes, 13 minutes, second, third, no, not here. From 13 to almost there, almost there. Yeah, it's right, right around here. Okay, I will first go and close the door, and close the lights. Oh, I'll turn it, I'll turn it again, I'll first adjust the volume. The question now is, what the United States of America and the international community is prepared to do about it? Because what happens? And or are there moments they depend upon the world a reasonably aware person to be able to fill in the blanks? Commit atrocities. They depend upon the world to look the other way until those horrifying pictures fade from memory. It's happened. The facts cannot be denied. And now is what the United States of America and the international community is prepared to do about it. Because what happened to those people, to those children, is not only a violation of international law, it's also a danger to our security. Let me explain why. If we fail to act, the Assad regime will see no reason to stop using chemical weapons. As the ban against these weapons arose, other tyrants will have no reason to think twice about acquiring poison gas. Over time, our troops would again face the prospect of chemical warfare on the battlefield. And it could be easier for terrorist organizations to obtain these weapons and use them to attack civilians. If fighting spills beyond serious borders, these weapons could threaten allies like Turkey, Jordan, and Israel. Failure to stand against the use of chemical weapons prohibitions against other weapons destruction and bold and such ally Iran, which must decide whether to ignore international law by building a nuclear weapon or to take a more peaceful path. This is not a world we should expect. This is what's at stake. And that is why the liberation, I determined that it is in the national security interests of the United States to respond to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons to a targeted military strike. That's my judgment as commander in chief. But I'm also the president of the world's oldest constitutional democracy. So even though I possess the authority to order military strikes, I believed it was right, in the absence of a direct or imminent threat to our security, to take this debate to Congress. I believe our democracy is stronger when the president acts with the support of Congress. And I believe that America acts more effectively abroad when we stand together. This is especially true after a decade that put more and more war-making power in the hands of the president and more and more burdens on the shoulders of our troops while sidelining the people's representatives from the critical decisions about when we use force. Okay, so let's see what kind of sense we can okay. make this clip from the speech. President Obama provides at one point earlier on in the prospect of chemical warfare on the able to fill in the blanks. Okay, so I want you to get a feel at this point. If you want to make notes, you can, but I want you to get a feel. I'm going to play it the second time and there'll be a third time. All right, uh, let me first do this whole thing and I will sit here. It's around 317, okay, all right. Uh, Okay, play. After years of committed atrocities, they depend upon the world to look the other way until those horrifying pictures fade from memory. These things happened. This cannot be denied. The question now is what the United States of America and the international community is prepared to do about it. Because what happened to those people, to those children, is not only a violation of international law, 
It's also a danger to our security. Let me explain why. Act, the Assad regime will see no reason to stop using chemical weapons. As the ban against these weapons arose, other tyrants will have no reason to think twice about acquiring poison gas and using it. Over time, our troops will again face the prospect of chemical warfare on the battlefield. And it could be easier for terrorist organizations to obtain these weapons and use them to attack civilians. If fighting spells beyond serious borders, these weapons could threaten allies like Turkey, Jordan, and Israel. Failure to stand against the use of chemical weapons would weaken prohibitions against other weapons of mass destruction and embolden Assad's ally, Iran, which must decide whether to ignore international law by building a nuclear weapon or to take a more peaceful path. This is not a world we should accept. Why, after careful deliberation, I determined that it is in the national security interests of the United States to respond to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons to a targeted military strike. My judgment as commander in chief. I'm also the president of the world's oldest constitutional democracy. So even though I possess the authority to order military strikes, I believed it was right, in the absence of a direct or imminent threat to our security, to take this debate to Congress. I believe our democracy is stronger when the president acts with the support of Congress. And I believe that America acts more effectively abroad when we stand together. This is especially true after a decade to put more and more war-making power in the hands of the president and more and more burdens on the shoulders of our troops while sidelining the people's representatives from the critical decisions about when we use force. Okay, so let's see what kind of sense we can make of this. All right. President Obama provides at one point. All right, so what I want you to do at this point, please write what the data is, what the claim is, what the warrant is, what the backing is, modifier and rebuttal. I want you to write it down and uh, and I'm going to play it the third time now. And you should be able to check and see whether you're making the right decision or not. Okay. So I'm going to play it, like I said, third time. to be able to fill in the blanks. Dictators commit atrocities and upon the world to look the other way until those horrifying pictures fade from memory. It's happened. It cannot be denied. Now is what the United States of America and the international community is prepared to do about it. Because what happened to those people, to those children, is not only a violation of international law, it's also a danger to our security. Let me explain why. If we fail to act, the Assad regime will see no reason to stop using chemical weapons. As the ban against these weapons arose, other tyrants will have no reason to think twice about acquiring poison gas. <clears throat> Over time, our troops will again face the prospect of chemical warfare on the battlefield. And it could be easier for terrorist organizations to obtain these weapons and use them to attack civilians. If fighting spells beyond serious borders, these weapons could threaten allies like Turkey, Jordan, and Israel. Failure to stand against the use of chemical weapons would weaken prohibitions against other weapons of mass destruction and embolden Assad's ally, Iran 
which must decide whether to ignore international law by building a nuclear weapon or to take a more peaceful path. This is not a world we should accept. This is what's at stake. And that is why, after careful deliberation, I determined that it is in the national security interests of the United States to respond to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons through a targeted military strike. That's my judgment as Commander in Chief. I'm also the President of the world's oldest constitutional democracy. So even though I possess the authority to order military strikes, I believed it was right, in the absence of a direct or imminent threat to our security, to take this debate to Congress. I believe our democracy is stronger when the President acts with the support of Congress. And I believe that America acts more effectively abroad when we stand together. This is especially true after a decade to put more and more war-making power in the hands of the President, and more and more burdens on the shoulders of our troops, while sidelining the people's representatives from the critical decisions about when we use force. Okay, so let's see what kind of sense we can make of this clip from the speech. President. All right, I'm going to give you just, you can just, uh, you know, type your response right now, just on Google Docs or, or Microsoft Word doc, and I'll tell you where to submit it, okay? While, while you guys take about, about, six to seven minutes to again do this and while i open it up for you on blackboard it has 20 points today
All right. So I have already turned this in uh, class. Those of you are online, you can see I have already put this in. You have to go to your. Uh, you have to go to your. To, 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 you have to go to class assignment. This is because this is a class assignment. So go to class assignment here. Click class assignment. The only these are all visible for me, but none of it should be visible for you. The only one that should be visible is uh, this map of Toolman's model of argumentation. Fill in the following based on the three minute clip of Obama's argument. Data claim, warrant, backing, modify, rebuttal. This needs to be turned into me by 10, 20. Uh, today, so you have about nine more minutes and uh, just turn it in. It's an in-class assignment. All right. Done, Amber? Oh, okay. So maybe people don't need that. Six minutes remaining.
Okay, uh, it's about 10.21. Hopefully everybody has turned it in. Okay, so this is what I will be talking to you about very quickly. I think I'm running on low charge here, 10 minutes uh, back uh, left. Okay, anyways, but I want to, I, I don't want to uh, delay this. So uh, now that you have done your, uh, you've mapped it out, you know what data warrant claim, all of that is five components. I'm not going to repeat it. So uh, now if I ask you, now, if I ask you a few things, okay, you just watched President Obama talking, right? And you heard, now you were able to map out what the data claim, all of that, five components. Now, if I, if I, if I said, I mean, instead of me, President Obama was here, what a treat. So if he was here, and if you had to, if you were the audience, or actually consider yourself as his debater, a fellow debater, and you had to oppose him, how would you do it? Let's say he says, I'm going to talk about five strategies of counter arguing, okay, with President Obama's first argument. Strategy number one, which is called direct denial, uh, where he says black and you say white. It is like a direct denial. So, what do you quickly, uh, what do you think what was his claim here? What did, what do you think he wanted to do? taking action against terrorism to prevent uh, future acts of atrocities. Absolutely. Uh, so he wanted to go strike Syria uh, by taking action against uh, against terrorism to prevent for, uh, future atrocities, as you mentioned. Yes. So he said that he wants to go to war with Syria, right? Because he doesn't want, uh, because he feels such and such is in threat. He feels the country is in threat. So if that's what he wants to go, if, if it's a direct, and if you have to do, oppose him, and if it's a direct denial, he says, I want to go to war. What do you think? Uh, how, would, how do you think? What would be an opposite of that? Because this, with direct denial, you're actually completely changing it from black. If his position is black, you want to change it to white. Uh, let's say the opposite of that would probably be, we shouldn't do that because it would possibly provoke 
Pro yes, so you, he says, or, or more violence. So perhaps he says, we have, we have to go to war with Syria and you come, you come, you do strategy number one, you attack, uh, respond to him by saying, by doing a direct denial, so no, war is not the solution. Think about peace. Have you thought about peaceful negotiations? Because we don't want to go to, that's not the best strategy. Think about peace. So that's a direct denial. He says black, black, and you'd say white. Okay. Second denial, second strategy. Challenge the relevance. Okay. So this is an interesting one. And most deb debaters do this. Is if you've heard that, you know, he's talking about how important it is for US to go to war with Syria because the Assad regime is certainly uh, doing things that is uh, against international treaty. It, it is against, uh, you know, uh, world peace. And he says that US has to act now with a targeted attack on Syria. And, and you have, you want to use strategy number two to push him. What do you do? Challenge the relevance. You tell him that going to war, you, when you say challenge, challenge the relevance, you actually deprioritize it. You tell him that that's not the best, in, that's not the thing that we should be focusing on. You tell him, you tell him, are you really sure that we should be thinking about war right now when the economy is in such a bad uh, situation? Don't you think that you should be thinking about the whole domestic situation right now rather than thinking about war? People are becoming, and that's what that's, that was happening at that time. You know, it was all taking, at that time, economy was going, taking a dip towards recession. And he says that you look at the number of jobs. People are going out of jobs. People are, don't have uh, enough uh, money to pay for uh, their gas. Their, their, they can't make bills. Uh, and is this the time for us to go to war? You basically deprioritize it. That's a strategy. And you tell them that this is what you, you, we shouldn't be even thinking about war because there are other things which are much more important that we should be looking at. That's strategy two. Strategy three, and one of the most used one, this is the most powerful one, strategy three, you attack the reasoning. You go ahead and that's the most part. Because if you tell the speaker that the way you're thinking, your reasoning is wrong, you're actually hitting him on the legs and he falls. It's like that. It's a, it's a place, warrant is, as I said, there is no argument that data claim warrant. And you tell him that your reasoning is messed up. Your reasoning is wrong. How would you do that with President Obama's reasoning? How would you say that his reasoning is wrong? What kind of reasoning was he using anyways? Also, because he violence happened, we should counteract with more violence. Yeah, that's right. That, that, that violence has happened and we should counteract with more violence or this is not the world that we should be living in because uh, a threat, there is a threat uh, and we have to protect our, our country right now. That's our first job to protect our country. Uh, and and to, to protect our country, we need to go to war. So the whole reasoning that is happening is that we are going to be attacked. We are going to be attacked, all right? And in order to get, in order to prevent that, we will have to stop them. How do I stop them? Attack back. Okay, that's the reasoning that's going on. So if you want to attack the warrant, the reasoning, you say that, are you really sure that we are in threat? Are you really sure that we are being threatened? Are you acting out of fear? Is it a fear-based uh, reasoning? Because I think you're afraid. I think you're, you're making a huge decision of going to war because of your own fear, because of your, you're in a state of panic and, you, and, that's, and that's not how you should be thinking. War is a huge step. We will lose our, our soldiers, our, our own, very own uh, soldiers. We will be, whole economy is again going to go down. A lot of loss will happen on both sides. And you're just doing this because you're just scared. You're afraid that this is going to happen. There is, you're acting out of fear. No one has said that, did you get any uh, messages from them this, which, are, which is saying that they're going to attack us? You're just acting out of fear. You heard, and if, some, if you say that, it's going to be hard for the person who's President Obama to refute himself. It's going to be hard because you're actually saying that you're acting out of fear. You're not being rational. You're, you're in a panic mode right now. Third. Strategy number four, using attack the evidence or proof. And for that, you have to do a little bit of research as well. 
he said that okay how do you know that uh, you uh, you know that they are uh, killing their women and children and how do you know that they are creating weapons of mass destruction who's your source reuters who's your source how do you know give us the proof because remember what happened during saddam hussein's time you guys thought that saddam hussein was creating weapons of mass destruction you went down hunted him and killed him and till date the bush, Ad bush administration was not able to respond uh, back and say that there were weapons of mass destruction we couldn't really find again that was another one where you were acting out of fear and you killed assassinated him because of your fear so show me the real evidence that shows that women and children are being killed that shows that he uh, that uh, that uh, he's uh, creating a uh, he's creating weapons of mass destruction show me the evidence this one will be it's it's a good strategy but he may be able to uh president Obama may be able to give you some yes i my my this this is may be able to come back and say that this is my source this is my writers this is the information this is first hand account this one will be a little the most important one will be warrant that will be hard for him to anyways i mean i think uh these are some good strategies and finally the last last one is when you turn this is an interesting one when you turn the oppositions you really accept it and you said oh wonderful you have a fantastic claim you have a great reasoning you have great proof but you know what i'm going to use it to my advantage you said absolutely we totally agree with you that we should be going to war we should be uh, we should be i mean uh, uh, looking at war and we should be thinking about but you know what before going to war why are you even i think you should be focusing on how to build a strong army we haven't been putting money into our defense i think that's what we should be looking at first building money into our defense building money into our uh, in, in, in putting putting uh, a lot of getting uh, weapons uh, getting uh, you know getting arms and weapons from other countries getting our military in place getting our naval strength in place these are the places that you haven't worked and i totally agree with you but i think you should be focused on this one rather than make a strategy about going to war right now first prepare yourself this is not the right time first prepare yourself and then think about going to war you're turning the whole you're accepting this and you're creating an advantage you can come with a counter totally change the focus and say that this is what you should be doing that's strategy number 5 these are five strategies okay uh, that you could be using when you are hearing a debate and you have to counter argue these are five strategies now for your homework class this is what i want i have given you if you go back, if you go to your um, if you go to your uh, blackboard go to uh, home homework okay go to blackboard and go to homework and uh, when you go to homework you have to scroll down till you cannot come uh, actually i'm going to make this unavailable so so, so it doesn't confuse you okay so you uh, okay all given so the only one i think you should be able to see is counter argument uh i know today is the last day before we go for our thanksgiving break all right so i will not be seeing you guys on wednesday it's a holiday it's a well deserved nice thanksgiving break that we all have all right so what i have done for you is i you've already turned in your first argument to me in your you know the, the assignment that you did on sunday midnight so that's already done now based on the uh, based on your on your on your claim that you made in 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 that you were trying to defend or that you created in your persuasive speech argument I want you to do this, and why I'm asking you to do this is a reason. You are going to be very well prepped. You already have, right? You know, already have your first argument in place. Now, the blind spot here is you don't know how people will, your fellow debaters, your classmates are going to debate with you, but you can be prepared. Okay, how do you prepare yourself by and by doing the five? If you cover these five strategies here. Through my experience, it'll be hard for them to kind of corner you. All right. So you will have to now tell me. You have to respond to these questions. You know what your, the claim that you made in your persuasive speech. You know what your claim is. You first tell me how do you think they can your fellow debaters can directly deny your claim. You say white and they say yes, uh, black. Okay. 
how do you think? You prepare a response and tell me, you know, this is the way I think they can directly deny my claim. And once you prepare your response, tell me how are you going to uh, defend yourself? If they say white, and if you're, you're saying black and they say white, how will you say, tell them that black is correct? How will you defend your position? So I want you to go through all the five things. Think about your claim that you've made in your speech. Think about how will they, how will your audience deprioritize your relevance? How will they say that that's not the most important thing? There are other things that they, you should be thinking about. If they do that, how do you think they are going to do that? I want your response. And then tell me, how, once they say that, how do you think you will attack back? Or how will you refute your position? Three, if they argue, if you have to know what, what kind of reasoning are you using in your speech, right? So if they attack your reasoning, I want you to tell me, how do you think they're going to attack your reasoning? And once they do that, tell me, how will you defend yourself? Similarly, if they attack your evidence or proof, okay, how do you think they're going to do that? And how would you defend yourself? Finally, if, if they try to attack your proof, your claim, if they actually look at your proof, look at your claim, look at your warrant and your backing, all of that, and they said, absolutely, we agree with you, but they kind of twist it and change it into their advantage. How do you think, how do you speculate that they might do that? And if they do that, how do you refute yourself? By doing this, you'll be extremely well prepared with your argument. You know that any question that comes your way, you will be able to respond back with strength, okay? So this one, you need to turn it in to me by, uh, by I have given you the date there, but I can just go right. Uh, by midnight on Sunday, 27th. And we will meet again on the 28th. We will meet in class, actually. Uh, we'll meet here in the Glen Ellen Center. Just let, let me look. So on the 27th, 11.59 p.m., it has 20 points that needs to be turned in. Oh, actually, and, and we are not meeting in class, actually. I, I remember. We are not meeting in class on Monday. We will be meeting on Zoom because we have our, uh, by, by that day, which is the 27th, yes. We will be meeting on, uh, here we go, no, but, Okay, workshop format, this is the day. It's a workshop format. So I will have all of this, all your counter arguments completely prepared. I will have that. I will have, obviously I have already have your first phase of speeches. I will have that and I'll have a workshop format where I will be reviewing your speech. Then I'll be looking at your counter arguments and then I'll probably perhaps I will be providing you some more tips to make your persuasive. Uh, first argument and your counter arguments more strong. And uh, then I will be asking, getting, asking you to guys to, this will be a little different. I'll be asking you to get into your, <coughs> excuse me, your focus groups. And I will be asking your fellow peers to shoot you with some counter arguments and you need to respond back. And, you need to, and that has to be done documented and that needs to be turned in. And I also, while you're working with your peers, I'll also come in and provide uh, provide support to you before, and you should be all prepared and all set before we go with our persuasive speeches. We'll be doing it completely on Zoom, online. We will be doing it on the 30th, uh, December 5th, December 7th, and December 12th. And that's it, and then our class will pretty much end. And finals, I'll, I'll tell you all, you know, it's not a, it's going to be more of a, reflective questions that you, you have to understand and engage in class and based on the, all the class discussion. So there'll be more, it's not like you can't really memorize and do that. You have to feel, understand the concepts and then I'll give you some uh, self-reflected questions uh, that you will have to respond to when in your finals. You don't have to come to class and do it. Okay, so that's it class. Uh, so that, was, that has to be turned in. So I think we're good now. Uh, all right, it's about 10.37. With this, the session ends today. Uh, I will be here. Unfortunately, I'm running really low on charge, so I will stop the, the Zoom recording right now. Uh, but I am here. You can call me uh, at, I'm not, because I don't have time, uh, battery life to continue till 10.50, uh, 10.55. But I will be here. I'm going to stop the session here. The, I will be talking to our, our student, uh, students who are in class here in regards to if there are any questions, 
that you may have in regards to your personal speed, anything, any questions that you have. And if you guys need to reach out to me, those of you who are online, please do call me. You have my number. It is 412-760-8348. I repeat, the number is 412-760-8348. It's also on the syllabus. You need to call me. Please call me and ask me your questions. All right, I'm going to be here. It's around, what time is it right now? Uh, it is 10. 10.38. I will be here till 10.55 to answer all your questions. All right. Thank you very much, class. I will end this online session here. Uh, all right. Here we go. Yeah, it's almost okay. I end the session.